Hello there. So in this video, I want to calculate the moment of inertia of a solid sphere, right? And the sphere is going to have a uniform mass density, has some mass m and some radius r, and it has an axis of rotation passing through its center, right? So one way that we could do this would just be to use the definition of the moment of inertia, right? I could say that i of my sphere is just defined as the integral over my entire sphere of gamma squared dm, where gamma is the minimal, right, this perpendicular distance to each of the little infinitesimal mass units dm, right? That would be gamma. However, this is a little inefficient, right? We would have to end up constructing a volume integral, convert this volume integral into spherical coordinates, right? Do all of that good stuff, which I'll probably do in the next video for the sake of uh, completeness. But we can be a little bit more clever about this, right? Specifically, we can build this sphere up with, with uh, a bunch of little infinitesimal disks. So let's see if I can motivate this technique a little bit by looking at an object over here, because I've never done this before. I've, I've always just used the definition of moment of inertia. But if I have some object and I've labeled it T for total object is this region, right? I've broken it up into three separate partitions here, right? And I've called these regions one, two, and three, right? And just based on the definition of integrals, right? If I sum up, right, over this entire T, gamma squared dm, right, this is equal to, I could just break this region T down into the three regions like I've shown here. So I could break this into integral of 1 of gamma squared dm plus integral over region 2 of gamma squared dm plus integral over region 3 of gamma squared dm. Now, if I define each of these terms as what they are, right, this is the moment of inertia over my total object, right? And again, it's about this, uh, it's about this z axis, right? So I'll leave a note that I'll put a little z up there to, to specify that this is the moment of inertia about this z axis here, right? Well, this is equal to the moment of inertia of region one about the z axis plus the uh, integral of region or plus the moment of inertia of region two about the z axis plus the integral of region three about the z axis. Right. And so we've hit on a very important uh, property about moments of inertia. Right, which is if I have if I have multiple objects, right, or even like I said, it could be the same object, but we break it into or we consider it like a collection of smaller objects, right? And all of these objects are rotating about the same axis of rotation, then I could calculate the moment of inertia of each of these little subdivisions of each of these smaller objects, add them together, and then that gives me the moment of inertia of my total object. And that's very powerful, right? Because what it allows us to do is when we're looking at this sphere here, we can say, okay, like in the last video, I proved that the moment of inertia of a disk, moment of inertia of a disk is equal to one half times m r squared, right? And I could imagine breaking this sphere up into like a bunch of little infinitesimal disks, right? And kind of stacking them up on top of each other, right? Just one at a time and I go boop, 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 and I go and I build up this entire sphere, right? And if I can calculate the moment of inertia of each of those, right, and then sum them all together, that's going to give me the total moment of inertia of a sphere. Now, if these disks are infinitesimally small, right, then this summation is going to turn into another integral, right, because I'm summing up infinitesimally small disks 
across this entire sphere, and I'm stacking up an infinite number of them, essentially. Right, so let's clarify exactly how we would do this. Okay, so I went ahead and erased out some of that, uh, some of the details on the sphere so that our picture can be a little bit nicer and cleaner going forward. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw out one of my little infinitesimal disks that I'm gonna break this into. So here we go. So this is what one of those disks look like. And each disk is going to have some radius, right? And I'm going to denote each of these little radii with a little lowercase r. Great. Right. And the name of the game is the same as before. Each of these disks are going to have some little infinitesimal mass dm, and they're going to occupy some infinitesimal volume dv. They're also, right, for this analysis, it's really important to note that each of these little disks are going to have an infinitesimal moment of inertia di associated with them, right? Which we didn't really use before in uh, the last two videos. So let's go ahead and start with these variables and then see if we'll need to define more variables kind of organically as we go through trying to solve this problem, right? As opposed to me just defining a bunch of more parameters on here and then things get confusing. Let's see if we can come across these as I try to tackle this problem, right? So the moment of inertia of my sphere, of course, is just going to be equal to this infinite summation, which is going to end up being an integral Right? We're going to sum up all of these little infinitesimal di's that each of these disks have. right? And we're going to sum these up from the bottom of the sphere all the way to the top of the sphere. That's all that we're going to do. And we know that each of these disks, if a disk generally has a moment of inertia of 1 half mr squared, right? this is going to translate to right? di, di, is going to be equal to, I'll just write this here, di is going to be equal to 1 half times little r, right, if each of these disks have a little r squared dm, right? So let's go ahead and write this out. And I'll take the 1 half out of the integral because that is that is a, uh, a constant. So we have 1 half times integral of r squared dm. Great. But we can't just integrate with respect to dm, just like in the last videos, right? We need to convert this into something that has like spatial coordinates that I can actually integrate over this sphere, right? And so, as I've done many times before, so I'm just going to write this down, we know that dm is equal to the mass density, which is rho, this is equal to rho times dv. But a volume element in this sphere, right, dv, we need to think about this a little bit more, right? Because it's not just, you know, like a little cube like before, like in the, the polar coordinates example, you know, th this is a hefty, this is a disk, right? And this disk, so this is how this comes about, this disk is going to occupy some height, right? And I'm going to call this dz, right? Some, right? Because we're along the z-axis. So this is going to occupy some dz. Interesting. So we're also probably going to want to define, we're also probably going to want to define the height of this disk too while we're at it. So let's go ahead and put this in. So this is at some height z from the, from the origin, right? And so, a volume element, right, would be if I knew the area of this disk, and what's the area of this disk, right? It's just pi times little r squared. So if I just take the area of my disk, which is pi times little r squared, and then I multiply by that change in height, because really it's like a little cylinder, 
dz, right? This is going to be equal to my volume element, dv. See what I did there? Cool. So let's go ahead and perform this set of substitutions now, right? So I have 1 half times integral of r squared times rho dv, where dv is pi times little r squared dz. Right, so let's go ahead and simplify this down a little bit. I'm going to take the pi and the rho out of the integral because the, those are just constant, right? Rho is a constant because we have a uniform mass density. So I'm going to have pi times rho over 2 times the integral of r to the fourth dz. Okay, so that's interesting, right? So I have this little r here, and I want to integrate with respect to z. So we're not all the way there yet. We need, to, we need to think about this just a little bit more, but we're very close, right? And what I mean by that, right, is here we go. So I have some little r here, and it's at some height z. So that's interesting. So surely there's a dependence, right, as I move up and down the sphere, I must be able to relate, right, each of the radii of my disks with its height up and down this sphere, right? So let's go ahead and see if we can do that. And the answer is, yeah, this, this actually isn't that bad at all because I can draw in, right, to, to the edge of my sphere. I can add this line in from the center of my sphere, right? Oh, this is the radius of the entire sphere, my capital R, right? So let's go ahead and write out Pythagorean's theorem. I've got some height z here, right? And then I've got the length of this leg here, little r. And the hypotenuse of my triangle is capital R. So here we go. So r squared is equal to z squared plus my little r squared. And so my little r squared is going to be equal to capital R squared minus z squared. OK, great. I just came up with effectively, right, a function of z that defines my little r. That's exactly what we want, right? Because we want to integrate with respect to z here. So great. So let's go ahead and make that substitution here. And this is r squared, and I want r to the fourth. So really, r to the fourth is just going to be this entire quantity squared, right? And there we go. And now I can directly substitute this in for r to the fourth. See how that works? OK, so cool. So we have pi times rho over 2 times the integral of r squared minus z squared, this entire thing squared, dz. OK, now what are the boundaries of my integral? That's the last thing I need to think about. So we know we're integrating with respect to z. OK, so where does this z range from? So I go, oh, that's pretty clear, right? We go right from minus r, right? This sphere just has radius r. So this point here is going to be minus r. And then this top point at the top, that's going to be a positive r. OK, great. So my boundaries of this sphere are just going to go from minus r to positive r. Cool, let's write those in. So we're going to go from minus r to r. Cool. Let's uh, just focus on this integral here. We'll do this integral, and then we'll uh, worry about the multiplication at the very end. So let's go ahead and do this. Right. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to apply this square. Right. I'm going to take r squared minus d squared, multiply it by itself, just so we have a, a list of terms, basically. Right. And so this is going to be integral from minus r to r of r to the fourth minus 2 times r squared times z squared and then plus z to the fourth dz. Great. OK, this integral is going to be really quick. Right. We just have a nice and easy polynomial. So we have r to the fourth times z minus 
2 thirds r squared times z cubed plus 1 fifth z to the fifth. And we're going to evaluate this from minus r to r. Cool. So let's go ahead and do just that. So we have r to the fifth minus 2 thirds times r to the fifth plus 1 fifth r to the fifth minus minus r to the fifth minus a two thirds and let's be careful with the signs here r squared times a minus r cubed plus a one fifth times a minus r to the fifth Right, and what we see here is we have nothing but odd terms here. And so, of course, because we have nothing but, uh, right, we were plugging nothing but odd terms in, and then we were just plugging in minus r and then subtracting that. It's a, it's a double negative kind of situation. This is just going to be equal to 2 times r to the fifth minus this two thirds r to the fifth plus a one fifth r to the fifth. Okay, great. Let's let's just let's let's keep going with this. This guy here. This is really ten over fifteen, right? This is going to be three over fifteen. We can think of this as fifteen over fifteen. This is going to give us sixteen over fifteen times r to the fifth. Great. Okay. So now all we need to do is we just need to multiply this by pi rho over two, and then we're done. So this guy here, and we're going to multiply by pi times rho over two. Now the only thing is what is rho, right? Well, if I have a uniform mass density, rho is equal to uh, my mass of my thing, which I labeled capital M, right? I labeled capital M over the volume of a sphere. And what's the volume of a sphere? Well, that's just four thirds pi r cubed. Great. And so let's go ahead and put this all together, right? So this is really going to equal. 16 over 15 times r to the fifth times pi over 2 times m over 4 thirds pi r cubed. Not making any simplification just yet, just so you can see the direct substitution in. Okay, now pi's cancel. Great. Okay, r cubes are going to cancel out. Bam, bam. And now we just have some constants to deal with. So if I have this division of three of four thirds, right, that's really the same as multiplying by three fourths. So let's go ahead and uh, just focus on our constants here. So I have 16 over 15 times three over four times one over two. Okay, great. Get some cancellation there. Get some cancellation over here. Oh my gosh. Oh, whoops. That should be four. <laughs> and then, oh my gosh, look at this. Cancellation here and there. Great. This entire thing, this is just equal to two fifths. So I have, right, when we put all of this together, I have two fifths times m r squared. And this is equal to the moment of inertia of my sphere. Fantastic.